Good morning. Today on Spotlight, we'll sit down with Warren C. Evans. He is the Wayne County Executive. That county back from the brink of serious financial difficulty. How robust is its budget and its future? We'll talk about that. And later on Spotlight, we'll go to our Southfield studio and we'll talk to David Kurzman. He is the Executive Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council, AJC, and he'll be talking about the rise in anti-Semitism. It's Sunday, March the 31st. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight from the Cube. And welcome to Spotlight down here at the Cube, our uh, home away from home, so to speak, in downtown Detroit. Warren Evans is the chief executive of Wayne County, one of my guests today on Spotlight. Mr. County Executive, good seeing you. Good to see you, Chuck. You just recently came off of your county, the state of the county address. Uh, good address. You've gotten good feedback from it. Uh, the question that everybody continues to ask is, you got out of that huge financial hurdle that you had to face when you first came into office. You're in the rebuilding process. Um, how's that all going and can you get comfortable yet? Well, number one, you can't get comfortable right. yet, but it's going well. Okay. Um, the real tough times are past, but fiscal discipline is going to be uh, of utmost importance for probably about the next 10 years. We, <laughs> We've moved, for example, our pension funding from 45% funded up to 61 okay. in the last four years. That's the good news. The bad news is it should be at 80. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to run budget surpluses uh, for many years to be able to take the surpluses and apply them against the unfunded liability to raise that percentage. The regular uh, ARC payments that we make every year don't get rid of the unfunded liability. They just keep us current on our current payments. So we have to always have surplus money to make that happen. What concerns you the most and what's perhaps the biggest challenge in this rebuilding process? Because when people hear, okay, you're not on the tip of bankruptcy anymore, then they tend to say, hey, I, I made sacrifices before, now I want my fair share, but I'm not sure you're in the position to be able to really do that yet. Well, we, we did give an overall uh, pay increase to all county employees, about 2.5%, and they're right. still way underpaid, and they know it and I know it, but uh -huh. you're right. Uh, we can't act like we're, uh, we're out of the water yet because we're not. There are a lot of things that we have to, uh, to get done. Our criminal justice complex, uh, for one, is a, a, a big thing looming on the horizon. And what people need to know is the biggest problem is really the amount of tax revenue. Uh, that we get because of Headley and Prop A, uh, even as property values are going up significantly in the county, our revenue is not following that. Uh, and so, you know, we're having to do much more with less. Through the whole four years of our recovery, um, we were actually operating with $100 million a year less than we had in 07. It's hard to believe. How do you make that up uh, when you don't necessarily see the same amount of money coming through the door? You just have to work smarter. Um, you have to be more efficient in the way you provide services. Certainly we have to uh, advocate for additional revenues, certainly roads and other related things. It's funding. I mean, it's still our dollars. Every Wayne County taxpayer is paying federal taxes and other taxes, but our return on that investment is not where it ought to be. And so I have to be a strong advocate for more federal dollars coming back and more state dollars coming back uh, into Wayne County to try to cover some of those areas um, as the property taxes uh, gradually grow. The governor is uh, all around this state uh, talking about a 45 cent increase in the state gas tax. Uh, are you on board with that? I'm on board with the fact that we've got to have a significant influx of money to fix the problem. All we've been doing over the last several years is a band-aid approach that even after our yearly allocation used as effectively as possible, our roads are still deteriorating. That doesn't get us anywhere. We've got to get over the hump. So, you know, while people can argue whether it's 45% on gas tax or coming from somewhere else, I give the governor tremendous credit for not taking a Band-Aid approach, but realistically trying to raise enough revenue 
to get us out of this mess, uh, especially since a portion of that money would not go into the traditional road fund, uh, Act 51 funds, which in my humble opinion... Which you don't like. Oh, no, absolutely not. It doesn't, it, it doesn't take into advantage critical uh, ingredients that are important, like the number of lanes of a road. If I don't think the general public understands they fund a linear mile. One linear mile, one lane. So whatever county has a one lane, one mile, they're going to get the same amount of money as I will in a linear mile with four lanes. And the traffic is here in Southeast yeah, Michigan. Yeah, I mean, anybody knows repaving four lanes costs more than repaving one, but the funding mechanism doesn't take that into account. And yes, absolutely right. The truck traffic and the fact that Wayne County is still a hub. People come to Detroit. People come to Metro Airport. We have an international border. We get a lot of traffic from other parts of the state, and rightfully so. We're happy to have it, but we don't have the revenue to support the roads and bridges uh, that need to maintain that. We want to talk about uh, what you're doing with uh, the mills and also with the park system. We'll be right back with Wayne County Executive Warren Evans. Stay with us. Hundredth anniversary of the Wayne County Park System coming up. Uh, I didn't realize until I started reading that there's so many parks in Wayne County. I think what 38 somewhere in that neighborhood. I don't know uh, the number, but there are a lot of them. Lot. And then when you add together here in Clinton Metro Parks and the different parks that the cities have, we have an awful lot of parks. Yeah. I don't know that we have an awful lot of connectivity. You talked about that in the State of the County address. Uh, what's your vision in terms of? Uh, what you want to do with the parks and why is that so important to your county? Well, I think, you know, uh, the next 100 years shouldn't look like the first 100 years. I mean, we've done a good job, I think, with the parks, uh, but I think uh, what people see as recreational activity now and the connectivity, it's a little different going forward. And so I think one of the big things is the connectivity between the parks in terms of bike trails, um, uh, hiking trails, those sorts of things, so that one can actually traverse from the far west Wayne County to the city of Detroit or downriver. I mean, the vision of being able to do that without crossing busy streets and, um, you know, uh, those sorts of things, I think is real. It makes a lot of sense, and I think it brings value to the 43 communities uh, that would be involved in that connectivity. Running parks is expensive. Um, have we reached a time just because the economy of scale in which um, we've got to be more creative in terms of not just the county running it, but you've got to do partnerships with the private sector and maybe even the state, like what was done on Belle Isle, in order to make it make sense financially? Yeah, I mean, I think to some extent, uh, once the separately uh, run parks are connected, there'll be value that way. but. We certainly have a project called the Mill Run Project mm -hmm. uh, in Heinz Park where we're taking old mills from the war years, World War II years, that have been dilapidated, barbed wire around them, look awful, been disintegrating, and allowing public uh, uh, private entities to come in and create small symbiotic businesses in those places and in return fix the mills so that they have the historic significance that they deserve. I mean, that was Rosie the Riveter, the first, one of those mills was uh, one of the first places that just hired women during the war effort. When we were doing the arsenal and democracy. Sure. Uh, underground railroad stops. I mean, there's history there that's significant, and right now it's in a terrible state of disrepair. But I can't take county strapped budget money mm -hmm. to rehab historical sites when I'm barely able to uh, maintain the parks and do the things that are necessary to keep our parks uh, in good shape. Uh, in just about a month or so, uh, we'll be making that track up north to the annual Mackinac Policy Conference. Um, obviously, Southeast Michigan and how it fits in with the rest of the state will be talked about a lot. Uh, you've been to a zillion of those. Um, are you, uh, how are you feeling about that conversation that's going to be taking place and where we are in Southeast Michigan right now? Uh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, this governor is proposing in terms of uh, uh, a number of things. I mean, what I'm seeing so far, um, I'm, uh, I'm comfortable with in theory. I, 
I'm one of those people that figures if I wanted to be governor, I should have run. <laughs> I, I don't try to right. run someone else's organization. I can just look at it and say, with all of the data that the governor has, I see her not taking a Band-Aid approach, but trying to actually attack substantive long-term problems. You think so, she's doing a good job so far and it's early, yeah? I do. Uh, your thoughts, uh, just a few days ago, Oakland County Executive L. Brooks Patterson, who you know well, uh, has negotiated with and just been a friend with and uh, a colleague uh, announced to his health challenges. Uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, it, it shocks everybody. I mean, we all um, have our mortality to deal with, and so uh, you hate to hear about things like that. Um, I didn't always agree with Brooks on policy matters, but I certainly uh, knew he was a fighter and a fighter for Oakland County. And I've got to tell you, there were times I called on him for resources to help me through, you know, our first four years of trying to get out of the Wayne County mess, and he was always helpful with the staff and those sorts of things. So I'm just praying for him. Hopefully uh, uh, he's a fighter and uh, hopefully he can fight his way through it. Well, we all wish County Executive L. Brooks Patterson the absolute best in this very difficult fight. And coming up, we'll sit down with David Kurzman. He is the Executive Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council. He'll be talking about the rise in anti-Semitism. Stay with us. Welcome back to Spotlight. We've left the Cube downtown. We're now back at our home base in Southfield. And joining me is David Kurtzman. He is Executive Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council slash AJC. Uh, he's been on this program before and welcome back. Good to be back. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I wanted to talk with you because we have started this conversation that will go on for uh, uh, weeks and perhaps even months on Spotlight from time to time uh, with prominent leaders throughout our community. Uh, and we're sort of calling it America at the Crossroads because we're having a lot of debate over a lot of things. Um, and you're a prominent member of the Jewish community here in Metro Detroit, which is a very prominent community, we should say, but a very diverse community. Um, Anti-Semitism, we keep hearing it's on the rise. Um, is it really on the rise or is that just uh, talk that's, or, or is that fake news, so to speak, I well, guess? Chuck, I appreciate the opportunity to bring the perspective from our community. And I think uh, the statistics show that the answer to your question is yes. Um, one measure of hate is the FBI's annual hate crimes report. And the most recent report from 2017 showed a 17% increase in hate crimes across the board. And when you zoom in on uh, crimes targeting a particular religion, we found that 58% target the Jewish community. That's the greatest number of crimes committed against any single religion is against the Jewish community. And we also can look at some of the study we've done of our own community here in Metro Detroit, a new community study, where 15% of respondents answered that they themselves have experienced anti-Semitism, and actually 45% of respondents, nearly half the community that answered, said that there is either a moderate or a great deal of anti-Semitism around them. That was their perception. So I think th those studies certainly prove it out that uh, it exists, it's around us, and it may very well be on the rise. Uh, and when you're having these conversations uh, within the community, outside the community, uh, what are you hearing and what does everyone think? Why are we seeing this spike so in I, 2019? Indeed, I think you have to look at the incidents themselves, right? So there's the statistics and then there's these anecdotes. And I don't think any conversation on this topic today can be brought up without Pittsburgh, right? Just the right, name right. Pittsburgh. The synagogue there in October of now last has year. Such a strong feeling in our community where you saw the largest uh, massacre of American Jews in the history of our country. And we're only a few months in the aftermath of that. And I think the, the trauma that was felt, and I spent days after that trying to share the experience of the Jewish community with the broader public. That's very much what we do at JCRC, AJC. Um, we're a community that's grappling with that, that hate. What, what might motivate somebody to gun down worshipers in their synagogue? And for that matter, what might motivate someone to gun down people in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, right, in Charleston, in New Zealand? 
Right? These were all attacks perpetrated against communities of faith, against minority communities. Um, and it's, it's something that is, is, I think, shocking for the average person and something that's hard to come to terms with. So where do we go from there? Um, the, do we need to increase security? Do we need to be having more and broader conversations uh, than we're currently having? Um, are, we, are we falling back on inter-community relations? W what is going on? Chuck, we have to do both. I think you're pointing to two important areas. One is certainly security, and we don't take it lightly. Um, security was a conversation within the Jewish community well before Pittsburgh. We're not new to this. This is something we work on. This is something we drill. Uh, we work with law enforcement. We train our teams, our own staff, and our congregants to be prepared. You, know, you have to know how to respond to any kind of emergency, natural disaster or, or an act of terror. So that's important. At the same time, we want our institutions to be welcoming. We want them to be open, right? We want people to be excited to come out and participate in communal life. Um, and to your point, intra-community or inter-community solidarity is critically important when it comes to this. I, I met, all of us woke up uh, uh, recently on a Friday morning to the news out of you know, Christchurch, New Zealand, of right. this horrific massacre uh, at, the, at two mosques. The first thing I did when I got to my desk was to reach out to members of the Muslim community. These are friends and partners of ours. These weren't cold calls, right? right. And we've talked about this before. To let These them are, know you care and care. that there's a commonality here in terms of experience. Indeed, and those calls that I made were the same kind of calls I was receiving back in, in October after the massacre at Tree of Life in Pittsburgh. So there's a common bond there. You know, we do this work in times of peace. We try to cultivate positive relationships with our neighbors. That's the work we do. But I think for the broader community, it takes on a greater meaning in the face of tragedy. And so we are, I, we're showing up, right? Uh, that Friday at Friday Prayers in Bloomfield Hills, we were at the mosque together. And it wasn't just the leadership of our organization or some interfaith activists. There were numerous rabbis who were there. I'd like to think our work plays a role in building those bridges that facilitate kind of more exchanges, more connection, uh, more understanding as we push forward. All right, we need to slip in a little break when we come back. Uh, we'll pick up on this conversation. Uh, all of this seems to be happening in the backdrop of a huge debate in this country over immigration and immigration today, and we'll see how that may or may not feed into all of what you're experiencing in the Jewish community. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Immigration, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of this is happening in the backdrop of a huge debate in this country over how does America get its arms around immigration? Do we need to get our arms around all of this? Do you believe this is feeding into what we talked about earlier, uh, uh, anti-Semitism and the rise um, uh, and hate among many different communities? There is actually a connection here to an incident we talked about earlier, this Tree of Life uh, massacre that the perpetrator of that event, he referenced uh, quite a bit online when he was spewing his hate uh, about his motivation for doing such uh, a crime. Uh, he pointed to the work of a Jewish organization, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society called HIAS, which for generations has been advocating for immigrants and asylum seekers coming to the country. And while now most people coming to America are not of the Jewish faith, it is still very much uh, a, a mainstream view, perhaps a consensus view within the Jewish community that fair and just immigration is part of who we are and what we stand for. And so this person who gunned down these innocent people pointed to the work of a Jewish organization as undermining his vision of what America should be, right? He had this white nationalist, white supremacist vision. Um, so no doubt these issues are interconnected. Um, I think we've been very clear in our advocacy that we need to find a path towards comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, it's something that I think people roll their eyes these days. How could we actually reach compromise? But right. we've got to fix Because we've been talking system. about it forever. We have been, but we've got to fix the system. And when we see certain incidents like you know, separating children from their family at the border, um, there is you know, unified outrage uh, across religious denominations within the Jewish community, um, across other divisions that, that that's not what America should be. And the Jewish community from our immigrant experience knows very well the consequences of closing our doors to people in need. That's not the America that the Jewish community has uh, 
you know, cherishes and that we have frankly benefited quite a deal from. Uh, uh, get your thoughts on uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was recently in the United States and um, uh, always makes news whenever he's in the United States and when he's not in the United States uh, many times. Uh, one of the things that he said, uh, which some people loved and some people rolled their eyes at, was the fact that he said that President Trump uh, has been the best friend that Israel has ever had. Your thoughts about that comment and then just uh, um, what you're hearing in the Jewish community. I think it comes as no surprise that an Israeli prime minister would want to have favorable relations with the president of the United States. Sure. Um, you know, the relationship between the U.S. and Israel is one of tremendous strategic importance. It's of shared values. Um, a recent Gallup poll that I saw uh, still shows that 69% of Americans have a favorable view of the state of Israel. So it's really encouraging that it, it is still a very widely held view that America I I is in alliance with Israel and that Israel can count on support from, from America. Um, I think Netanyahu is certainly pointing to some developments during the last couple of years that play well for him. Right. They're right, they're good political victories. Um, but frankly, they're something like moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem is something that was well received across the Israeli political spectrum, right? Um, and, and frankly, was following a, a bipartisan support for moving the embassy that was, you know, Congress initiated that back in 1995, and this president followed through on, on that. So um, I think you find a, a time where, you know, Netanyahu feels very comfortable in Washington, um, and one can certainly understand why he would. All right. Uh, he's coming up on an election, uh, I think April 9th. Correct. Um, uh, he's uh, had some domestic problems of his own there, uh, charges of corruption. Um, uh, if you had to look in your crystal ball, uh, what do you think his chances are of getting reelected and how is he sitting right now? Well, look, Israeli politics are a complicated game and I've been studying <laughs> this for years, but I'm not going to suggest don't, that I know what's going to happen. Don't dip your toe in that one, I'm right? I'm not going to go there, but I will tell you that um, it, it's an interesting time to be following what's happening there. And, you know, part, you mentioned the relationship with, with Trump and, you know, let's see what the Israelis think of that, right? right. Uh, let's see what they think of, of, of uh, Netanyahu's other strategic decisions, some of the ways he's governed, um, how he's either, you know, uniting or in many ways dividing Israeli society uh, for political gain. Um, let's see what the Israelis have to make of that. It's, it's a robust democracy. It's a messy democracy. It's one of a, a diversity of people, including a sizable sector of the population that is Israeli Arab that will be voting in the election. Um, it's a parliamentary system, so they've got to figure out coalitions afterwards in terms of how they're going to govern. I can tell you one thing. The Jewish community of Metro Detroit will be watching very, very closely to see what happens. We'll get you back. Pleasure. Look forward. And we want to thank you at home for joining us. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.